Welcome to the third day of AppSicon and our third plenary. Um, I, uh, Jim and I are the conveners for this, um, but my job is just to go through a couple of housekeeping announcements. So I want to remind you that tonight is open mic night. Uh, for those of you that went to them, um, I went to this event last year, it, or two years ago, it's very successful and you can see all the talent within amongst the astrobiologists. We're not just great scientists, we also have the performance bug to some extent. So please come tonight, it's in Regency ABC. Uh, in addition, how many out, uh, of you out there have picked up your um, passport? Not to get out of the country, but your passport to, under, uh, to go through the posters and understand about the science that is done by the RCN. Show of hands, there better be some people that picked it up. Remember, this is your opportunity to win great prizes. There are 22 posters you need to go take a look at. You'll get a stamp for each one of them, and then people who fill out the card are eligible for three big prizes, uh, either a gift certificate to uh, AGU swag, um, a, a hospitality basket with goodies from Seattle, and the top prize is free registration to AppSicon uh, 2021. So this is your last day to get stamps. Tonight's the second um, uh, poster session, so please, please look for those passports and get them filled out. So without further ado, take it away. Okay, good morning. Um, now I'm told this is a clicker. Um, welcome to the morning plenary session on the origins of life. Um, we're gonna ha I'm going to tell you quickly what the format of this is. I'm going to give you some very brief kind of introductory orientation slides, and then we're going to go through a series of presenters. We're going to talk for about five minutes each. We're going to give them a moment to comment on each other's presentations, discuss, and then we're going to open this to a community discussion. Um, okay, it is working. So the origin of life is a, the best scientific question I can think of in that it has resisted explanation for a very long time. Um, people from all sorts of fields have something very important to say about it. Um, we have a couple of bookmarks we can add to, the, to understanding what even the question is, which is we exist, we are alive by our own definition, we have some concept of how old the Earth is, um, we have some concept that there was a moon forming impact and between when the earth formed and when that impact happened, it would have been very difficult for life to exist. Um, we have some hints of when there was liquid water on earth, um, which we think is essential for life. So that gives us some indication of where the planet was becoming habitable. We have some evidence of when there actually was life on earth, which gives us now a, a oldest point for life on Earth. So that still leaves us an extremely long window to understand what kinds of chemical and physical and geochemical processes were happening on the planet. Um, and that leaves us a really large window um, to allow for the evolution of the living things that exist today whose phylogenetic history we can trace, right? There could be a very large gap in complexity between the first living things and the things that are still existing that bears some conceptual explanation. Um, I'd just like to leave you with this very nice factoid I found a couple of weeks ago. Um, now that we are able to do massive bibliometric searches of chemical databases, it turns out that only 3% of all reactions that have been done by professional chemists, essentially since chemistry has been a professional science, have been done for longer than two days. All right? That's a weekend, right? That's you. you set the reaction up on Friday and you measure it on Monday. All right, that's, that's potentially a very important clue to something we might be missing conceptually. All right. So why should this community care? Um, we do have this concept of the Fermi paradox. There are books written, 75 explanations for the Fermi paradox. There are many, many more than 75 possible ones, right? So we know where we are thanks to the astronomy community in relation to large um, cosmic structures. Um, so far, we've been looking at our solar system without much luck. We've been looking in our galaxy without much luck. Our galaxy is just a single point in a much larger structure of the cosmos. Um, 
where are they, right? Something is wrong. The origin of life might be um, an important bottleneck in why we're having so much trouble finding something. Um, so some open questions in this, this field are what is life? What is the origin of life? What does that even mean? We need to have some consensus about that. Is it easy or hard? Is it rare or frequent? Is it a unique process or are there multiple ways, right? The chemical space is very large, so there could be multiple ways for things to self-organize. Um, are there different kinds of life? Are we a specific kind that happens to have a, a very open-ended evolutionary dynamic? Um, do all things kind of end up being the same at some point? Is there a convergent nature to living things? Is it fast or slow? Comes back to that weekend question. Is it, do, do you need very, very specific types of planetary environments for life to start? Um, and then the, you know, the question I'm interested in as a, as a lab chemist is how does that happen? I want to see it. So without any further ado, I'm going to turn this over to Lori Barge um, from Caltech. And the Jet Pulsion Laboratory, you're welcome to come to the lectern or sit there as you, as you feel free. Um, oh, wait, sorry. One quick plug. We actually do have, a, we do have a, a professional society dedicated to this question, which is called the International Society for the Study of the Origins of Life. <coughs> Our next meeting is in Ecuador next year um, in Quito, and there's an excursion to the Galapagos Islands. If you're interested in these questions, please consider joining the society. Um, you can find us at isol.org. Um, you'll find a community of people who are dedicated to trying to understand these questions. And with that, I will turn it over to Lori. All right, so my name is Lori Barge and I'm at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And my perspective on origin of life is coming from kind of a combined geology and chemistry perspective, but also not just geology of Earth, but geology of other worlds. And so Jim asked us to talk about stuff that, that we are, you know, that we like seeing in the field and things that we wanna see more of and just kind of thoughts about things. And so I just wanted to talk first about how it has been really nice in general to see more incorporation of geological conditions into chemical experiments for the origin of life. And that's important because early Earth has so many possible varieties of conditions that you could have. We don't actually know that much about early Earth. We know some major things like there was no oxygen in the atmosphere, there was an ocean, but you know, debates are still had about things like how much land was there and how deep was the ocean and so on. And so it's important to consider a lot of different environments. And here's just some pictures of environments that are of interest to different people in this field, things like hydrothermal vents and hot springs on land, volcanoes and lightning and beaches and so on. And I think one of the most important things is for those of us who are doing reactions in the lab to try and you know, make these realistic, of course, and try to incorporate different important geological conditions into your experiments. And one of those is gradients because a lot of environments that you see on planets are actually not closed systems, they're open systems. And so you have far from equilibrium conditions, you have gradients of things like temperature, pH, redox conditions, chemical concentrations, and so on. And it's possible to do experiments in setups like that, and you sometimes get very different results when you do. So I think that is one thing to you know, consider, and, and maybe it's a good way to collaborate as well between geologists and chemists. So that's one thing that's been really nice to see. And in a lot of the uh, experiments that are going on in this field, it's, it's exciting to see how we can start to narrow down which, which conditions are conducive to certain reactions. And so when you do experiments in the lab for origin of life, we're usually doing things like, you know, what, at what pH does this reaction really go forward? Or does it work best in the presence or absence of oxygen? Or is there some you know, other ion that really helps it or hurts it? And it's important to consider, you know, like let's say that you have a reaction where a uh, presence of magnesium really helps it. Is it the fact that it's magnesium? Is it the fact that it's a divalent cation? Will other things work too? If you have oxygen there and that works, can another oxidant do that also? And just kind of trying out things to figure out what actually is affecting the reaction as far as a condition space. And I guess one thing that I, I think would be helpful as far as trying to apply a lot of this origin of life work to planetary science, because in planetary science, we see a lot of environments that are not so Earth-like. But they're also, they, they do contain conditions that can be important for origin of life. And one of the important things about combining origin of life and space exploration is that we always look for organics for looking for life in the universe. And there's this idea of going from abiotic to prebiotic to biotic. 
But if you never had a full origin of life on a world, it's possible that you might have a really complex organic abiotic system that's something like you wouldn't necessarily see on the Earth, because if you have that happening here, life consumes those molecules. So maybe there's possibilities on other planets of having complex abiotic organic chemistry that might look a little unrecognizable to us, but it's things that we might see with future missions. And when we're trying to do experiments and figure out you know, what environments should these types of experiments belong in, if we find that a condition drives a reaction, let's say that, I don't know, amino acid synthesis happens best at alkaline pH and with a partially reduced mineral or something, that is a great thing to know. And I think that one thing to avoid is to jump from that into saying there's a super specific environment on Earth that this reaction must have occurred in and therefore the origin of life occurred in this particular environment. Because we should be open to any environment that has the condition that facilitates that reaction. And that's it's good to think about because when we go and we explore the solar system, we find a lot of environments that we did not expect. So I put, I put pictures of things here that we found with missions that we did not expect to find. And there's a lot of stuff like that, things like, you know, we went to Enceladus and found these amazing plumes full of organics. There's organics on Ceres. We have oceans on Europa and other ocean worlds, possible brines flowing on Mars. And so if a reaction goes forward with a certain set of conditions, rather than restricting it to one specific early Earth environment now, if we just say what those conditions are, it really helps planetary scientists to kind of go out and look for that elsewhere in places where maybe you wouldn't have thought it could exist. And so when we look for an, another origin of life in the universe, or maybe another prebiotic situation that never quite made it to life, this is also very helpful. So I'm excited as we go forward to kind of see how the organic chemistry we observe on other planets can relate to the types of chemistry we do in the lab with our abiotic prebiotic system, and how that can relate to how life started here. So I think that's about five minutes. <laughs> so yeah, so I'll uh, pass it on to Elsula. Hi, so I'm Jamie Elsula from NASA Goddard. And when I think about these questions about the origin of life, I come at it from the perspective of trying to understand that inventory of prebiotic organic molecules, the, the ingredients that were present for when life arose on Earth, and whether those ingredients can be present in other places, and what we can learn about them. And one way to do that is to look at all of the different environments where we know organic chemistry can take place and can produce and cause the evolution of these ingredients of life. And so that's everything from the diff diffuse interstellar medium through dense molecular clouds, the formation of planetary systems where we know there's organic chemistry taking place, and then into um, small primitive bodies within a solar system where, again, some of those earlier materials might be incorporated and undergo further chemical evolution. Those bodies can then deliver organic materials to the early Earth or the, to other planetary surfaces. And then we also know that on planetary surfaces, there's a variety of environments where this chemistry can also take place. So there's a lot of places, a lot of ways in which those building blocks, those ingredients of life, can be formed. But when I look at the cartoon like this, one of the questions that immediately springs to mind is, are any of these environments unique in what they produce? And was anything unique and essential for the origin of life? From the work that's going on, looking at all of these environments, we know that some of the ingredients, the building blocks that we think are essential to life on Earth, like amino acids, can be produced in multiple environments. They're found in multiple environments. And when you see that, it leads you towards thinking life could be common, because these ingredients for life appear to be common. The reactions that form them appear to be robust and be able to occur in different ways. And so that's encouraging. But what we don't know yet, because I think it's a really hard question, is how you go from these ingredients, from these prebiotic molecules, to the first life. And so we don't know if there's anything essential and unique that was required when life got started on Earth. And then from that, we also don't know if, there's, if that unique essential material can only be produced in one or a few of these environments. So I have big questions about the universality of the uh, formation of these ingredients of these essential organics for life and the differences, uh, the diversity that can happen in these, in these different environments. So that's one way of looking at this. Another way of thinking about the questions that we have uh, relating to these ingredients of life are looking at the tools that we have for studying and understanding them and the limitations of these tools. And speaking of limitations, since I only have five minutes, I'm not really going to talk about the top or the bottom of the cartoon right now. I'm just going to focus in on the middle part, the, what, the ways that we're able to study the organic inventory present in small primitive bodies within our solar system and what that tells us about the ingredients that might have been available for the origin of life. 
And we have a lot of tools that are available for studying these. We have things like in situ missions. So, for example, the Rosetta mission to Comet 67P that was able to visit a comet and expand our knowledge of the organic inventory present in a cometary environment. Or we have sample return missions, and we're very much looking forward to the asteroidal material that will be uh, returned by Hayabusa 2 and by Osiris Rex. That's going to give us a lot of insight into this organic inventory, these ingredients that were available in the early solar system. But it's important to note the limitations of this as well. We're still only able to sample a very small number of environments, a small number of bodies within our solar system. And then we have to extrapolate from that knowledge and basically try and assume that that's telling us about the diversity, the full uh, ingredients that were available. And that's an important thing to realize that we still have a lot of limitations, even though these these tools tell us a lot, there's still a lot of limitations. And one way to look at that a little further is by looking at our study of meteorites. Meteorites have been a really great resource for understanding this organic inventory throughout the solar system. They sample a variety of different parent bodies and different environments. But for many, we still have to be careful of which meteorites and how much we're extrapolating from. And so this is just a chart showing published amino acid analyses over the years. And you can see that for about the first three decades on this chart, Almost all of the published analyses were of one type of meteorite, one group of meteorite, the CM carbonaceous chondrites. And of that, almost all of those studies were of the Murchison meteorite. Murchison's a great meteorite. It contains a lot of organics. We learned a lot about potential inventory there. But it's not until the last decade or two where we've started to really expand our knowledge of the diversity of chemistry throughout other parent bodies, other meteorite groups. And when we do that, we see that Murchison's not unique, but it's also not necessarily representative. And so this is just an example of looking at amino acid abundances on a log scale on the y-axis. Every bar there is a different meteorite. And it's just to show that if we study only one or two or a few samples from throughout uh, these different environments, these different solar system bodies, it's not necessarily giving us the full picture. So I think it's important to recognize the limitations of what our tools are and what we're able to do. And the final thing I want to say in my few minutes is that it's important to understand these, this prebiotic inventory, these ingredients for life, not only to understand the origin of life on Earth, but the potential to recognize life elsewhere. And so many of you are familiar with the ladder of life, and I've put up just a, a little part of the ladder of life table here, and I've circled some of the questions, some of the potential biomarkers that rely on molecular, uh, mo on molecules, on potential biomolecules as biosignatures. And I've circled some of the things that we need to know in order to put this these questions into the proper context to be able to interpret them. We need to really understand that full range of abiotic chemistry. So what Laurie just said about, you know, we might see totally different abiotic chemistry in a different environment elsewhere. We need to really understand what abiotic chemistry can produce and things like how much of an enantiomeric excess can you produce so that we can later, we can understand what we see elsewhere as potential biosignatures versus what abiotic chemistry can produce. And so that's sort of my quick overview, um, and I'll pass it off to Chris Keating now from Penn State. Thank you. So I find my mind blown by pictures like the ones we just saw. Um, I'm a chemist, and I think about compartmentalization. And I like to think about things that, that are sort of tangible. Um, and so it's really hard for me to think about. Uh, planetary systems and the origin of life. But I, I try, and I, I find it really fun, even though it's hard. But what I want to talk to you about is compartmentalization. So that's where my mind focuses. And I think compartmentalization is something that would fall between sort of having these beginnings of molecules, and then how do we get to something that starts towards life. I'm not going to answer that for you. Don't get excited. But, but I will talk about compartments. And you know, what's a compartment good for? Well, it's most fundamental, right? You put things in it. That's what a compartment is good for. And what does that mean? And I think in this community, let's see, can I make a pointer? This, uh, that, maybe? Yeah. I think this last part is actually what people think about in the origins of life community. They think about you need a compartment to make an individual. And, um, and then they argue about whether need is the right word in that sentence. And those are good things to argue about. Um, that's not really what I want to be the main focus today. Um, yes, making an individual is really important. It's something you can do with a compartment. There are other things that happen potentially before that, though. And this might get to some of the things that Lori was saying about even in a prebiotic situation, there are roles for complex chemistries to be going on even before life. And I think compartments would have played important roles in this. 
And so I want to think about sort of more fundamental things. So you put things in a compartment, what does that mean? Well, it changes the thermodynamics of association. So like non-covalent associations, oligomerizations, that sort of thing. It changes uh, kinetics, so you could have rate increases by having locally high concentrations. It changes potentially the microenvironment and might maintain a microenvironment that's more favorable for certain kinds of chemistries than others. And maybe that favorability is good for whatever it is that you need to have happen to start life. You could imagine it might be bad also. Um, selective entry and exit. So think about gatekeepers that are formed by the compartments. And the sort of example to make this tangible for you, maybe a membrane, right? And so these are all things that you're getting from having a compartment before you have to worry about whether it's alive or whether it's a protocell or whether it's an individual. And then ultimately, it can become those things as well. Um, it may need more to get to those places, right? And I think that's a fair thing that we can think about. Um, the other thing I wanted to quickly mention is that these compartments don't always need to be static. They can come and go. So if you think about coupling this with a gradient or a wet dry cycle or something like that, your compartment might be coming and going. So capturing and releasing some reagents uh, in a cyclic fashion, which might have consequences uh, that could be interesting. So I just want to give you something to sort of sink your mental teeth into, because I, I always need something sort of tangible. It's like, what are we talking about here? What kind of thing? Uh, so I'm showing a couple pictures of compartments that you could have that you're going to get, I would say, almost for free on a planet that has rocks and water like this one. Um, so yeah, there's going to be rocks. That means those rocks have surfaces. They have crevices. They have different chemistries on the surface. Molecules will adsorb there. That can be thought of as a compartment. It can change reactivity. Uh, in addition, you can have uh, liquid surfaces, right? Uh, molecules, many molecules that are organic are surface active, even ones that you don't think of as surfactants. Uh, those then is a way of concentrating. If there are waves or wind, you could make those into aerosols. And so those then can start to dry and concentrate those molecules further. If you have a cold environment, right, now you can form ice in your water. And the bits that don't want to get into the ice crystal, they would screw up the ice crystal. They'll form little interstices of sort of salty, organic, rich areas if there are organics, or maybe just salty if there are not. These kinds of environments probably were important. They were probably there. And so you should probably think about them and the role that they might have played in sort of forming some of these early molecules. Once you have some molecules that are organic, then you can make all different kinds of compartments. So a really important kind of compartment is a lipid membrane and other kinds of lipid self-assemblies that form. These can form from a wide range of molecules that basically have certain different solvent properties on the different ends. And so they'll self-assemble. One of the things they can form is a compartment that could contain things and can serve as a gatekeeper. The last kind of compartment I'll briefly mention is sort of near and dear to my own personal heart because we're studying them in my lab a lot. And these are things called coacervates. Which I understand is a loaded word in this community, but it really is just a physical chemical phenomenon where you have associative phase separation in water. So multivalent molecules stick together. They make a phase. That phase has different solvent properties, and you can put stuff in it. Um, it's not a protocell. It's just a phase. Maybe it could become a protocell. Um, and so this, these structures are really good, not so much at gatekeeping, but at accumulating. And so if you think about the sort of different properties of different compartments, they're not all going to play the same role. And we probably shouldn't try to compare them as if they were playing the same role, which I think a lot of times we're tempted to do. I would argue instead we should think about, well, over the time that occurred, we would have started out with some compartments that you kind of get for free on your planetary surface, whether the kinds I talked about or different ones on some different planet. And those can start to be functional. And then as time progresses and you start to have organic molecules, those can start to make their own compartments. And these would all be sort of interacting in the same milieu. And probably those interactions are quite important. So I want to leave you with a couple of questions to think about, since we want to spend a lot of time on discussion. Um, so Jim alluded to this. You know, are, are we talking about things that are easy or hard in terms of starting life, right? Uh, not just life itself, but the parts, the steps. Should we be focusing on steps that are easy, steps that are hard? As an experimental scientist with graduate students who don't want to stay forever, I try to focus on easy ones, but I don't know if that's the right choice, right? It only needs to happen once to start life. Um, specific molecules versus motifs. Right? Should we be trying to figure out exactly what molecules were likely to be there or, or being inspired by ones we know now and studying those? Or should we be thinking more generally, like amphiphile instead of a particular amphiphile, or a polyelectrolyte instead of a particular polyelectrolyte? Um, and the other two are maybe more obvious, sort of what would happen if you put these things together? I think a lot of times in order to do a clean experiment, we try to keep it simple. That's a good approach. But probably it wasn't simple and clean when things were actually happening. And the synergies that might arise when you start to combine different compartment types together, or compartments with gradients, thermal vents, things like that, could be really enabling and really rich chemistry that we should uh, definitely start exploring. And then last, and I think we've heard this from some of the other panelists, you know, 
what did happen versus what could happen. They're both interesting questions, right? And I, I think that the set of all things that could happen is bigger than the set of things that did happen. We don't have a second example of that yet, but I'd like to hope someday we'll find one. So I'll leave you with that and pass you over to Eric. Thanks, Christine. So I thought I would address the multidisciplinary aspect of this session with some comments from the perspective of statistics and computation in the sense of computer science. Um, I want to start by acknowledging Jim for what has to be the most optimistic session title ever. Uh, but behind that, a theme in a lot of my remarks will be that all of our accomplished, well-understood science is built on a relatively small number of paradigms for order. And I expect that the problem of origin of life is actually going to require a whole set, none of which we have yet covered. And in that sense, this is still really early days. And that's good. And that's kind of a good frame for what follows. So Jim proposed a set of sort of really open and fundamental questions as a way to try to seed the activity and the perspectives that we know are active in this meeting and bring them into discussion with each other. And I figured, yeah, OK, just pick them up and throw down some perspectives and give people something to, you know, to object to or fill out. What is the origin of life? Sure. Whatever else the origin of life also is, I think when we understand it, we will have to understand it as a cascade of non-equilibrium phase transitions in the energetics and chemistry at a planetary scale. A couple of years ago, Sarah Walker put out a really great formulation of this in a review. She said, the origin of life is not something that happens on a planet. It's something that happens to a planet. I was very jealous that we had not come up with that. Oh, very good. Thank you. From David Grinspoon. OK. Um, but the particular words in here are all links to areas where we understand something about either robustness or search in complex spaces or discoverability that will ultimately apply to some aspect of the emergence of a, a form of order in the biosphere. Why has it been hard to explain or gain consensus? Um, I would say that for most of what we need to understand, we have not had compelling ideas yet. And if anything, the fact that we have less consensus is kind of a relief. It's an improvement in the state of our community from what it has been in some past times. Uh, but more concretely, Chemistry is big and it's structured, and it's big in a way that none of the sciences that we have yet understood really command. Probably the closest we come is the theory of representations and algorithms, I would guess, and there's an affinity among those. At the level of mechanisms, we may have a pretty good control of what's possible in chemistry, sort of physical chemistry and up to rules, but at the level of what the forms of order are and how to systematically search in systems, I think we're still pretty early on in that. But more abstractly, you could say that we have only ever really been theoreticians of the simple. All of the accomplished sciences are fundamentally simple in their organizing paradigms. And I think the origin of life is going to demand that we become theorists of the complex in a way that's completely new. And I think that point of view is resident in this community in a lot of places. What do I want people to do more of? I have some concrete ideas on that to follow. But are there things about the origin of life that we will never know the answer to? Here I want to push back a little bit on something we sometimes see in the literature in this community. I'm not a fan of the argument that because you can't build a time machine to stand on Hey and Earth, we'll never know. Because we would never apply such a glib formulation to other areas in science. And in areas, a lot of areas we understand, we know that it's not true. So the, the constructive point that I mean to make in this is that the whole thing that has made biology hard to reduce to a benchtop problem has been the fact that historical contingency brings in contexts that are hard to reconstruct. When the loss of memory makes some of those contexts unrecoverable, that's not the end of understanding. That, in some sense, removes some of the obstacles that had made it hard to understand before. And we want to keep in mind that that's an opportunity. So there's even a technical sense that we have simple versions of in other areas in which the things that we do not know and cannot know are another name for the things that are not essential to causation. So I hope there are aspects of that that maybe we can talk about. But what can we do? There are certain aspects of the living state that have wound up leading us and tying together a lot of the most fundamental organizing principles in life 
And they've done so across decades and even across generations. And one of the greatest of these has been the genetic code. So back in 1967, Carl Woese had recognized that the problem of reliable translation only made sense as an outcome of a dynamic of innovation sharing that required horizontal gene transfer, but then also required to block horizontal gene transfer in order to preserve itself. And this established an essential role for the code as something that was both needed to be and made to be an error buffer. That's led to a whole generation of super high quality work on the analysis of the ways in which it's an error buffer. Eight years later, Tsefei Wang recognized that a lot of the assignment order in the code is actually an order of elaboration of biosynthetic pathways, which he anchored in amino acid biosynthesis. But in the same year, Hyman Hartman recognized what I think is the more correct argument, that the anchors for all those actually are CHO biochemistry in the citric acid cycle compounds and pathways and in carbon fixation itself. Fast forward 25 years, in this wonderful review of Woes, Olson, and others, where they tried to give an encompassing uh, reconstruction of the history of the amino acyl tRNA synthetases, they were forced to confront the fact that different subsystems of biology are conceptually different in their character of modularity, and that this abstract property governs the style of evolutionary dynamics that they experience. So I think we can argue that the genetic code, like this kind of seismic triple junction, is active again, and that there's a bunch of neat stuff going on that it brings together. So in the modern effort to uh, reconstruct the synthetases, but other proteins that have many forms of rearrangement going on at the same time, we're having to go beyond the simple probability models that have been the mainstay of phylogenetic reconstruction. Greg Fournier has an ongoing uh, wonderful stream of work on this that I know many of you know. In parallel to that, there's an idea that thioester uh, energetics was maybe a linchpin of very early biochemistry. This goes all the way back to Racker, I guess, in the 1930s and some intuitions best developed by Christian de Duve. It's kind of lain fallow for periods. It's now active again, uh, as for example, from a bioinformatic direction in this paper by Goldford et al. Um, but at the same time, in the realization that a lot of the earliest folds, the Rossmanoid folds, are essentially sulfur bioenergetic proteins in any number of elaborations. And the remarkable observation by Yakubovsky that this includes both classes of the amino acyl tRNA synthetases. And then from yet a third direction, the realization uh, from this paper by Nicholas Kovac, sorry for the misspelling, and Lauren Williams's group, that as we look at the elaboration of folds in the accretionary sequence of the ribosome, you see these Rossmanoid uh, folds kind of flowering around the same time as translation. So I want to speculate here that these are all windows looking into the same room. We're standing on the threshold of an era where instead of using diversity to reconstruct states, the next generation will be the use of diversity to reconstruct models of dynamics. And the form that that will have to take is a new kind of community structure of hypothesis-driven experimentation complex computational simulation that then generates for us the probability models that we use in comparative historical analysis. And you know, me wanting things to be interesting almost more than I want them to be true, the speculation would be that the three problems that we see in the code right now, the elaboration of organosynthesis, whether there were bottlenecks in bioenergetics, and how folding first learned to happen, Maybe none of those make sense as a problem considered in isolation, but each of them winds up being part of the solution so that when we see them as three aspects of the same problem, the whole thing kind of unravels and we can see clearly. So I think there are many in this uh, meeting who have highly expert perspectives on this, maybe not all the same, and I hope we can hear some of those brought together, uh, what they think the future is. So thank you. With this, I want to turn over to Martin van Cranendonk, University of New South Wales, and the director of the Australian Center for Astrobiology. Uh, thanks very much, Eric, and, uh, and the panel and the selection committee for allowing me a couple of minutes of your time. Uh, so I'm a geologist, and I'm interested in environments where you can find complexity. And uh, I think we heard from Eric and from many others that you know, the origin of life is such a complex problem. It's probably the complex problem. And so on Earth, and of course back into deep time, where are the complex systems? 
And so we've all grown up hearing about, you know, possible origin of life at deep sea vents and the excitement about water rock interaction generating chemical complexity. And here I want to sort of talk a little bit about, you know, this uh, sort of evolving idea first started by Darwin that hot springs on land are of interest. And so they share the same, you know, many of the same features as deep sea vents. They have hot water rock interaction, but they have many benefits and hence the title. Uh, I, I got a bit ambitious with my slides, so I'm going to uh, go through a few of them quickly. But one of the first key benefits of hot springs on land is they are able to undergo wet-dry cycling, which we know is important for making biopolymers. And so we can see on the right-hand sort of set of slides from the top to bottom a wet pool drying out to a very dry pool, and the biopolymers synthesize on the margins of those. Uh, hot springs have fresh water, so they don't have the problem of oceans and being too salty. Um, another big uh, component is that, of course, oceans are basically uniform dilute reservoirs and concentrating elements to prebiotically important uh, ratios is difficult in oceans, but much easier in hot springs. And a key here is that different springs can concentrate different elements. Uh, another one, as Dave Deemer and his group and many others have shown, is that you can form lipid vesicles under low pH conditions that mimic the size and the structure of protocells. And one of the things that I get most excited by is that hot springs occur in fields. And each pool is different in its chemistry, its pH, its temperature, and they can mix and match components. So in terms of complexity, these are complexity factories. And so this is just an example from Rotorua in, in uh, New Zealand, where you've got Champagne Pool, which is precipitating arsenic and gold at pH neutral, you know, just a, a few meters away and exchanging information with a sulfur-rich pool at pH 2. But the question that I'm interested in as a geologist who works on early Earth is that could early Earth have hosted hot springs? And could ancient hot springs provide the necessary conditions for origin of life as best we understand it? So with regard to that first question, some have suggested that hot springs are not a good environment because on modern Earth they're basically ephemeral systems. They get formed in tectonically active areas, but they also get ripped apart. So they have durations of something like 10,000 to maybe a million years which is pretty short if you think about the complexity required for origin of life. But early Earth was not modern Earth, and most studies suggest that the very early Earth was a stagnant lid, a one-plate planet like our nearest neighbors, and that crust formed very thick um, crust with volcanic welts and edifices. And so if we look at our one-plate um, nearest neighbors, Venus, for example, are there parts of a one-plate planet that would stick above the ocean and give exposed land surfaces? So here's an example of a very large structure. It's volcanically driven. It's called Artemis Corona. It's one of many coronas. It sticks several kilometers above the baseline elevation of Venus. And if there had been a global ocean, it would have been above water. On Mars, of course, everybody knows Olympus Bonds, 25 kilometers high, long-lived volcanic edifice on a much larger Tharsis rise all of which stuck above. So yes, you can do that. And if there was a hydrological cycle, those beautiful calderas on the top of Olympus Mons would have had hot springs. So I'm uh, working on some of the oldest life on Earth in Western Australia. We've been looking at these stromatolites for many, many years in the Dresser Formation. And we're now really turning to understand that system in terms of the elements and its potential for acting as an analog for understanding what might have been an origin of life site on Earth. And where we're going with this is that we have found the stromatolites um, shown here in purple. This is the horizon where they occur. They sit within a succession that's only a few meters thick, but that we have now discovered, largely because of uh, the work of my student Tara Dokic, but others as well, has been part of a terrestrial succession. And what's exciting is that if we look at that terrestrial succession, parts of those units here are hydrally hydrothermally influenced marine carbonate concentrated iron and manganese in these bedded carbonate rocks here. In the stromatolites themselves, they're sulfidized, but they have concentrations of zinc. They also have enrichments of arsenic and molybdenum, showing that these elements were available in that system. As you go up the stratigraphy, we found a one to two centimeter thick crust that's bearing tourmaline crystals, and this is a hot spring deposit that was concentrating boron, and then in the geyserite that, uh, that Tara found, we have concentrations of titanium as the mineral anatase, 
and also potassium in kaolinite and illite in the light layers through here. So what we're starting to develop and what's interesting to think, oh sorry, and then in the foot wall where the hydrothermal veins are cutting through and providing the fluids, there's concentrations of apatite, so we've got phosphorus in the, in the chert veins, and the hydrothermal alteration of the foot wall, beautiful pillow basalts here, all altered to potassium bearing clays. So we have clays, we've got potassium, and we can now start building up a picture of what a hot spring at 3.5 billion years ago looked like. And what we're really excited about is the possibility that it's able to concentrate these prebiotically important elements, potentially over durations of significant time. And so that's kind of where our, our group is headed. There are lots of questions in this, um, but if we think about it in terms of complexity and early Earth, we need to start building up that kind of repertoire and thinking about, you know, how do all these various components fit together in an uh, area? And so we're trying to understand the, the variation, the variability, and the gradients around, as, as Laura talked about, as being important. And um, so I think there are lots of interesting questions that this is opening up and allowing us to look in a very relevant deep time analog. Um, I just want to make a little quick shout out that for those of you who might be interested in uh, hot springs, there are two special issues of astrobiology coming up toward the end of the year with more than 20 papers, including a model on the origin of life in hot springs by Bruce Damer and David Deemer. Uh, there's stuff on the Pilbara, but a whole range of investigations on hot springs, so stay tuned for that. Uh, and with that, I'll pass over to Boz. Um, I'll do quick acknowledgments and um, pass on the Boz wing from University of Colorado at Boulder. Cool. Okay, well, as um, some of you may know, and as I'm acutely aware of, um, I am not an expert in any of this origin of life stuff. I've only been thinking about it for the last couple of years. So if you um, will sort of bear with me and allow me to take this kind of idiomatic approach. Um, what I decided to do was rather than sort of talk about the research that we work on, was talk more about the lessons learned um, from the perspective of somebody new to this uh, field. So I think the A's and the B's of original life research are pretty clear. You can look around at your neighbors at the table next to you and realize that we have a collaborative, curious community um, that, at least from my perspective, is exactly what's needed to solve the problem of the origin of life. If you look along this table up here, it's not necessarily what we all do, but the impressive thing is what we have done. I mean, Martin, did, did you think when you were mapping salt domes on Axel Heiberg Island back in the 80s that you would be up here now? No, it's an interesting journey, that's for sure. Yeah, it is. OK, but one of the hard things about breaking into origin of life research, I found anyway, is making sense of the literature. And this is probably an issue with trying to break into it from popular science books and articles. But it just seems like there's so many recipes and scenarios and models out there, all of which have an incredible logical internal consistency. And it's really hard to find the threads that you want to pull at to try to, try to test them. So for the C and D and E of origin of life, um, getting into origin of life research, what I wanted to do was talk about some general um, perspective and lessons learned that may allow for um, those of you who want to break into the field to do it. So the C is pretty easy from my perspective. It's really nice to think about constraints and broad constraints, celebrating broad constraints that may actually allow us to rule out certain scenarios, models, or recipes. And Martin's already alluded to one of these, the idea of when continents emerge. And this is um, the subaerial hot springs at about 3.45 that he discussed. And what I've shown here actually is a recent study that hopefully will be coming soon to a tabloid near you, um, where what we've done is we've been able to constrain what the 018, 016 ratio of the ocean was, slightly younger than these subaerial hot springs. And what it suggests is that at least from the broad perspective of oceanic water cycling, there weren't a huge number, a great mass of emergent continents. And this isn't to say that it's contradicting the 
geological evidence that Martin showed us, but rather what it's doing is it's complementing that because geology I like to think of as a snapshot, whereas geochemistry is more like a palimpsest that allows you to look back in time and integrates over a long history of events. The history, the duration of that history is as long as the reservoir that that geochemical tracer is acting in. Um, and so this is uh, some work that Ben Johnson, um, uh, current postdoc at CU, future faculty member at Iowa State has done. I'm sure he'd be glad if you reached out to him on Twitter and asked him about it. Okay, the Ds have to do with, don't worry, just do it. Oftentimes when we think about scenarios and models and recipes, what we try to do is we try to make things realistic or go ahead and test one specific aspect of it. And, and actually, I think that's kind of limiting. And an example of don't worry, just do it is a great experiment that um, Laura Rodriguez did when she was a PhD student with Chris House at Penn State. And I'm not going to go through this in any detail, except to say that the experiment started by generating chemical complexity in a spark discharge apparatus. And I don't know if anybody thinks that spark discharge apparati are good analogs for origin of life anymore but they are good ways to generate a large amount of chemical complexity. And the punchline here, I'll let Laura tell you about. You can find her here, you can write her, or you can wait for the paper to come out, which I think is gonna be in a couple of weeks. Finally, let's look at the E's, okay? One of the great things about coming into a new field is that you learn new vocabulary, things like exaptation. And what I don't mean here is the biological definition of exaptation, but what our colleague David Baum would call the cultural definition of exaptation. Tools, techniques, theories, or models that found function in one field, see if we can take them and use them in a new way. And a really fantastic example of that you're going to hear about this afternoon um, at a talk by Lena Vincent. Here is Lena's Twitter handle if you want to tweet at her after this. And really, the idea is taking this well-honed concept from microbial experimental evolution, where if you have serial transfer over a number of generations, successful mutants are inevitable, and applying it not to a biological system, but to an abiological system. And I will let Lena talk to you this afternoon about what these peaks and valleys represent, but suffice to say it has to do with these awesome patterns that you're seeing here. This really is chemical and mineral evolution in action. So, there we are, the A, B, C's, D's, and E's of an introduction to origin of life research. And I'm sure that you all will have your own versions of these, and I hope that we can discuss them uh, after this. Thanks. Wow. I'm, I'm a big fan of the George S. Patton School of uh, Organizational Psychology, which is never tell people how to do something, just tell them what you need done, and they'll surprise you with their ingenuity, right? But um, I would like to take a few minutes. If there's anything you guys would like to comment on about each other's presentations, this would be the time to do it. <laughs> and and at that, then let's move on to, to audience participation. All right, I'm going I'm to make a point then. So this question of subaerial hot springs <laughs> seems that very, it, it would rule out most of the other places in our solar system that we're looking for life at this point, right? How strongly do you feel about that? <laughs> you mean, how much do I want to annoy most of the people in the audience? <laughs> That's fun. Listen, I, 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 as I said, I come to it from a, a point of view of, developing complexity. And um, I think we have to be aware of the fact that, you know, some ideas are, are testable and, and I think as, as Eric was saying, you know, it takes such a huge community to develop the resources and that's what we're doing here to really investigate these systems. And it's the evolution of systems and I think at some point you have to start to try and understand where the breaking points are. Like, how far can a system go? And you can do, and we've heard, you know, there's some beautiful examples of we can go so far and get product A, B, C, D in a system, but maybe a system is limited to those products. And I think one thing we need to start 
thinking about it, and, and of course many people are already, but you know, is, are there systems or do we have to transfer systems or do we have to think about mixing systems? And um, I guess from my point of view, the, the beauty of Hot Springs is that you know, there are a uh, hundred different systems and they change hourly, you know, seasonally, daily, whatever. And um, so for me, and just in terms of thinking about complexity and mixing components and generating, you know, compound A over here and lipid membrane B over there, and uh, it's, just, it's just from that point of view. Um, I didn't want to get into the idea of what that means for astrobiology and exploring other planets, but, you know, it does have some profound consequences, but we have to be certain that that's correct, and of course we're not. So, I don't think we, we're at the stage where we can um, say yes or no to any exploration. Any exploration is good, and as we heard, we'll learn more about um, parts of those systems if we go to anywhere, because every time we go somewhere new, we learn something. So, you know, there's incredible value in exploring systems, whether we think they're our preferred one or not our preferred one, because we're going to keep learning, and, and that's what this business is all about. So. Um, yeah, I've got my preferences, and you know, I'm interested to get feedback from, from the community and, and put those ideas out there because they're testable, and um, that's what we need to do. So it's just another step along the way of, of providing some ideas for people to follow up on and, uh, and generate new um, interactions and, and workings with people in different fields. And so you know, I think what, what Boz was saying is with the uh, ABCDEs, um, part of it is that embracing experiments, and then looking outside your particular discipline and getting ideas and um, taking those. And yeah, all the time we're making it better. <clears throat> People are lining up. OK. Uh, <laughs> let's start on the, with Vladimir over here. Uh, Vladimir Arpitian, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So I want to uh, share my perspective as an astrophysicist and heliophysicist turned astrobiologist on the origin of life. So I want to comment on A and B on astrobiology. Normally when we say astrobiology, we mean that the, the, the biology, the, the distribution, uh, uh, origin and distribution of life in the universe, and the astro means universe. But actually, I think that the astro means astra from stellar. It's basically maybe reflecting the intimate relation between the, our sun and the, and the planet. So the uh, uh, stellar evolution, as we learn, goes you know, shoulder to shoulder with, with the planetary evolution. So the question, and, and, and the, the, uh, we, we learn over the last few years that the stars provide a huge amount of energy, ionizing radiation, that may uh, provoke the formation of the you know, building blocks of prebiotic chemistry. And I didn't see actually the sun and, um, and the solar uh, radiation on this picture, on this uh, chemical evolution, um, which probably a, a missing link. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely an important part of it. And the, the picture is just to get us thinking about all the different environments. It's not totally inclusive. But um, yeah, it's really important to think about that interplay between uh, the, the sun and the other environments where the organics can be formed. Carl Pilcher, Blue Marble Space Institute of Science. This is a great topic and a great panel to address the topic. I've heard it said that there are three great questions that confront us as inquiring beings, and that is the origin of the universe, the origin of life, and the origin of consciousness. And looking at this question of the origin of life, uh, in that context, uh, the question comes up not only did how did life arise on Earth, but why did life arise on Earth? And Eric alluded to that in his comments when he quoted Sarah Walker, quoting David Grinspoon, that life happens to a planet rather than on a planet. And Eric was too modest to note that Sarah quoted David in a review of Eric and Harold Morowitz's marvelous book which anybody in this audience who doesn't have a copy of it really ought to get one and spend some time with it. Uh, so my question to you is, if, in, with that as, as sort of context, if this were an Oxford-style debate and the question on the table was, life is a natural organizational state of matter, what would be your positions in the debate? Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, no, I'm going I'm to say something small because I, we've had the beginnings of this conversation before and I know there are several people who sort of independently have arrived at the same point of view and are looking for how to push it forward. We, we are too state dominated in our thinking and we are not process oriented enough. And one of the things that for a theoretician makes the living state interesting is that the problem is not only and maybe not principally a problem of understanding the organization of matter in states. Rather, it's a problem of understanding the organization of events in regularity of processes. And that's an area where we can make enough analogies to things that are well understood that we're not without tools. But I expect that in this new menagerie, there's going to be a lot that we have never seen before in our understanding of states. So it's both empirically and also theoretically a really appealing direction to go into. And I would just, you know, um, I've spoken to Alexis about this in the past. Um, sort of a theory of the organization of processes as the, the mindset for thinking about origin of life is just a, a nice direction to go from a lot of perspectives. Yeah, this is uh, Murti Gudipati, JPL. Um, uh, what we know, uh, by the way, there was a tremendous amount of uh, advancement of uh, our understanding of how life could have evolved. Uh, I want to congratulate the whole community for that before I go into my comments. So what we know today is the precursors of life. They're everywhere there, as Jimmy pointed out. And what we know is that there is life on Earth. We all know that. And what we don't know is whether there is life elsewhere. And what we don't know is how the precursors of life have evolved to life on this planet. Keeping these points in mind, it reminds me that we are in a situation like a gold rush some time ago, digging with limited tools, trying to find out whether we can hit the gold or not. And so what we should do is adapt a policy of pluralism. In other words, let everyone dig in every place, rather than to say that uh, my religion is the religion and my way is the way. And by the way, people who, who were digging gold became actually lunatics sometimes because they didn't get <laughs> gold. And unfortunately, I have also seen uh, uh, my beloved uh, co-scientists uh, you know, becoming so engrossed in their belief system. So what I wanted to say here is the path forward to understand the origin of life on Earth and probably potential life elsewhere is to adapt the pluralism and uh, let us move forward and try to understand. We may not be able to answer these questions in several lifetimes to come, but let's not give it up. Thank you. Oh, hi, uh, I'm Stuart Bartlett from Caltech. Um, and I just wanted to ask a couple of questions about our philosophical approach and about a, um, an example sort of paradigm shift that happened in machine learning. So for a little, I mean, I'm not a machine learning expert, but for, for, for a while, um, machine learning algorithms were evolved m mostly by a kind of hill climbing algorithm. So you have some target function and, uh, and you have your system at one state and you, ch you change things and whenever you change things uh, with a slight improvement in function, you adopt that and you sort of, you know, move up a, uh, a hill in some, in some kind of landscape. Um, and this, this kind of worked okay, but not, but not always particularly well. And more recently, in the last sort of 10 years or so, this technique called novelty search has enjoyed a lot of success, where when you're modifying your, your network or your system, instead of optimizing for increases in function, um, you optimize for increases in novelty. And the problem with the uh, objective-based approach is that often you end up in, in dead ends, whereas with novelty search, you, you explore the space and, and, and you do a lot more discovery. And 
in the community, they found that novelty search can be much, much more effective at finding solutions to complex problems than simple hill climbing techniques. Um, so it, it strikes me that this might apply to the origin of life, because often, in our, whether it's our lab systems or our modeled systems, when we see, when we see some change that's incrementally more like uh, life as we recognize it, we think, oh, that's good, and we sort of keep moving in that direction. But we have no guarantee that when, when life is complexifying that it actually works like that. And so my question is whether we should also uh, accept uh, sort of a novelty search philosophy when we're exploring our systems. Uh, so, so we just allow the system to do things which are different rather than uh, just more like what we're expecting, because what we're expecting might be wrong. And in, in another sense, I also wonder whether um, uh, in the sense of getting ideas from different disciplines, whether understanding the origin of life, we might have to st um, work or study in different disciplines completely. Um, yeah, I just wondered what the panel thinks about that. I feel like Lee Cronin is probably the most energetic spokesman for that point of view that I know of in the room. And I, I think he would say that there are versions of that that are good to do and that are being pursued right now, very much in the spirit of what you suggest. But I should let Lee speak for himself. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Sarah Maurer, Central Connecticut State University. Um, I heard some of you use the term complexity to describe diverse molecular chemistry. And I guess I'm kind of curious as to whether this is a, just a definitional issue, but is a mixture of chemicals that has a large diversity actually complex? Or is complexity something more like life where we limit molecular diversity and we have more complex reactions going on or something that's different than actual diversity? And so when we're using the term complexity, does that include all diverse systems or is it a specific subset of those systems? So I think that's a really interesting point uh, to think about because I think people do use complexity in different ways here. You know, I tend to be looking at the organic inventory of prebiotic chemistry, and I, I, when I talk about a complex meteorite extract, I mean it has millions of compounds in it, and trying to understand the interplay of reactions that led to that is a complex system. But then there's other uh, ways of looking at complexity that means you're getting to more and more complex molecules, complex systems, things that you know, that are more biologically complex. And so I think it's being used both ways in the community right now. And that's a really good point that, it, that that's a word that means different things in different contexts, different conversations, and it's good to be aware of that. Um. I'll comment on that too. So it, you're right that you, know, you can get a huge diversity of compounds. It's pretty easy in a mineral organic experiment to get all sorts of products. And the issue is actually trying to pare down the side reactions. And so you don't want to, you know, always focus on the thing that you're trying to make, because that also can be wrong if you're not trying to make the right thing. But it, just having a whole bunch of products doesn't mean that you're going to get to life. You need to be able to direct the reaction towards something. And an enzyme can do that, and life does this very well. And you need to be able to connect these, you know, connect these dots of different reactions. And so part of what we do in experiments is trying to find abiotic versions of this. But you do have to cut down on side products. Otherwise, it's, it, it can be very hard to go forward. That there, there's a very nice paper written by Bob Hazen and Jack Shostak, Patrick Griffin, I forget who the fourth author was, but on the concept of functional complexity, um, where the, the components of a system can be very simple, but the function of the system can be very complex. So it, it matters, right? So. Helen Hans from Santa Barbara, and I want to ask Martin, how do, to remind us how we know that the, pill, the dresser formation started out above sea level? Um, so it, it didn't start out above sea level. It's, it's actually quite a lovely story. If you look at the sequence, it's all pillow basalt submarine below, and you can see a, sh a, a slow shallowing, that's hard to say in the morning, a slow <laughs> shallowing of the stratigraphy, 
until you get to these very distinctive um, hot spring deposits, this geyserite, which is well known from modern environments and does not form in submarine. And we've got desiccation cracks, we've got ripples, there's a whole variety of information in the sedimentary sequence that it actually becomes emergent. And then it subsides again. So we, we're, we're working on a paper that we want to call the rise and fall of early life because it looks like it's actually driven by pulses of magmatic inflation and deflation uh, that brings the surface up to an exposed condition. And so that's, of course, at 3.5. That's already way past you know, the starting point when the crustal configuration may have been much different. So ours is really just a snapshot of this ancient environment, and we have to then project again further back. So that's our, our challenge. Uh, Paul Higgs from McMaster. The genetic code came up in uh, Eric's talk, and the genetic code is important in Earth life because we've separated the roles of proteins and nucleic acids, and we have two chemically different ways of storing information. And it's by no means obvious that life elsewhere would need two kinds of informational polymers. We can imagine something like an RNA world when there's one kind of polymer, and in an RNA world, an RNA is its own thing. It's not coding for something else. So that would be one kind of polymer. But it's also maybe not obvious that we even need one kind. We, we might be able to envisage life without informational polymers. So, so would anybody like to speculate on when we find life elsewhere, will it have two kinds of polymers? Will it have one kind or no kinds? <laughs> and it, and okay, so if nobody else wants to speculate, I, my, my, my feeling is, my feeling is um, polymers are pretty important. So my, I would put some money on finding informational polymers in life elsewhere. Maybe not the same ones, but some kind. And, and also, I guess I would, I would say that separating genes from catalysts is also important, but that doesn't mean they need to be chemically different. I mean, you can have the same kind of molecule, the, ke the same chemistry which makes a catalyst and the same chemistry that makes a gene without necessarily needing to make the chemistry of the catalyst different from the genes. That's, that's where I'm heading with this. I want to not take too much time, and I want to give you an answer that will probably be unsatisfactory. Um, and I can do both. Uh, <laughs> I think there's an idea of typicality that has played a big role in creating a theory of information. And what's typical in the world of small molecule chemistry is different from what's typical in the polymer domain. And the idea that some things that life relies on depend on the constraints, that there's not typicality of structures, kind of following Boz's point. And there are other things that life depends on that entirely require extensibility to be a typical property, is the way I would look for the relative roles of polymers versus the non-polymer aspects of organosynthesis. Uh, Mike Travisano, University of Minnesota. So like Boz, I'm really from outside this community. Uh, um, I do experimental evolution and try and investigate the origins of innovation. And <clears throat> when one does that, when one looks at the origins of innovation, quite often one finds that the first steps in the origins of in some innovative thing that's changed biology as we know it, that it's almost unrecognizable from the things that motivated the study itself. So like the innovation of multicellularity, the first steps of multicellularity, First, multicellular organisms are quite, you know, pathetic as multicellular organisms are. And so when I think about the challenge of origin of life, I, I think of it as a transition from a non-living state to a living state, maybe abiotic, prebiotic, biological. And it seems to me that the challenge for that is recognizing this group's success already. That the very first steps in the origins of life are hardly going to be recognizable. They're going to be pathetic. They're barely going to be operating as, as a biological system. And I kind of wonder if we actually could find the very first steps for the origin of life that happened on, earth, on this Earth, at what step would we find it that it's recognizable to us as the origin of life? This life, 
what, how much complexity would it have that we would be able to say, aha, that's the one? I have a paper you can read on that. <laughs> well, that's I why I've said I outside the community. Maybe more of a comment than a question. It's a question for you guys. I mean, even, although some have answered it, apparently. Yeah, let me have a go at it. Yeah, come and find me later. Yeah. I can share. I don't have answers. Uh, so, so, maybe we do. Yeah, yeah. So I have a question for the panel. I mean, I could ask lots of questions, but I really think the panel's done an excellent job to really show how this community uniquely, I think, can reinvigorate the search for life and the origin of life, because we want to search for life. So my question is, we're going beyond to historical contingency and coming up with our own pet projects or what are going to make us famous in our isolated field for whatever thing we think is interesting. And what we probably need to do, given there's so much money going to be spent on search for exoplanets and analyzing their atmospheres, is how can we create a new type of way of collaborating? What problems can we agree on as a community that we can give the younger people to say, oh, I'm going to work on that one, work on that one, and I advocate for the kind of particle physics type of collaboration. Physicists are just as grumpy as chemists, particularly particle physicists. Don't let the nice collaboration fool you. There's a lot of money invested in a big machine. And we don't have that yet, but we do have big machines, big telescopes, and that data is very costly. So my question is, can we come up beyond the life ladder and these other things with a way of collaborating together to inspire the younger people, that they don't feel they're coming in an adversarial way. And Absicon being so inclusive and really pushing things forward, I think it's a really nice platform to ask those questions together. So I pause my own selfishness to tell you about my question, but really to ask the panel question about how we can develop that collaboration and inspire other people. I'll just say that, you know, while you were saying that, I think it's absolutely true, and Absicon is a great way to start bringing people together and, and to build these collaborations, and hopefully the new RCNs will help with that as well by bringing together people. that Those are still kind of focused on individual uh, theme areas. It can help to bring people, bring the uh, younger scientists in and people who are looking at the same question from different perspectives. And so that, that's something to keep an eye on, I think. I mean, maybe, maybe competition categories, like who has the most pathetic... No, the last question, <laughs> right. almost life today, or who has the best new kind of prebiotic soup reactor or, uh, you know, atmosphere analyzer. These little competitions in little areas where people would dial in and we bring in people and we develop their, their skills, be it in chemistry, physics, machine learning or whatever else would be quite good. So maybe we should think about some competitions that we could give each other. Some reality TV uh, science <laughs> competitions. <laughs> I don't want to be that famous, but may maybe just some competitions. <laughs> maybe, with some, maybe with some money, maybe we could get a billionaire or two to give some money for some big competitions in the field. I don't know, just a suggestion. Thank you. Uh, just, just, uh, just quickly on that, uh, it's really good to bring up the physics community and that always comes up. And I guess one thing they're able to do very well is decide what experiment they want to put their resources into as a, as a community and say, oh, at this stage, this is the most important thing, it's going to cost X billion dollars, and we'll get everybody in and we'll agree to put in this massive, you know, grant application for, you know, multinational things. So I guess if you're talking about competitions, you might think about setting up a, a set of selections of questions, like the, some of the big questions and, and what are approaches that are so big that we can't do it in an individual lab, yeah, and I then agree. would it take a multinational, you know, group and say, okay, let's locate in a, a lovely location and build a, a huge set of hot springs that we can, <laughs> you know, whatever. Um, but you could, have, you could have a series of questions and then, you know, in a group like this, you could sort of rank them and then maybe that's where then you can get consensus towards what's a really important set of experiments that we can't do individually. My, my phone says we are supposed to end at 9.45, so I'm going to say one more question from Steve. Well, we'll... You see, this is bad because I was finding this meeting too self-congratulatory, so I was going to mix it up and get myself into trouble. And the reason I was going to do this was because I was serving as an advisor for a panel, a federal panel, which, whose name I'm not, I'm not allowed to mention, to reviewing origins of life grant applications. There was a person in the room, a new investigator, a callow youth who said, hey, you realize 
if all of these proposals were funded and all turned out perfectly as expected, we would not make a dent at all in the origins of life problem. And the reason for that has actually already been mentioned by Lee, is that people tend to do what they have done before, and all of it's very interesting, but the facts are there are paradoxes, and in fact this we're coming off of a, of a, of a three-year Templeton program now, we raise five and a half million dollars to give out to people, many of them in this room, to where we were not asking for proposals to just go further with whatever we were interested in, but rather to identify a, a step in the formation of RNA, for example, in the RNA world first hypothesis, which if it could not be solved, the origin of life was impossible. And I got a lot of criticism. People attacked me personally, some quite bitterly, some in the room saying, well, you took money from this creationist organization, the Templeton Foundation, and it didn't help that I said, okay, if you want to go look where the paradoxes are, just go to a good creationist web page, and they will tell you why life could not originate without the intervention of God and solve one of those problems. And so by focusing that, I've actually been quite surprised at how well the people who were funded in this program have solved these paradoxes. So, Jim, in your title for this session, I came here expecting to have me do exactly what Martin just said, which was to come up with a list of the next set of paradoxes, because, of course, one of the central paradoxes is that if you take organic matter, put energy into it without the benefit of Darwinism, it doesn't create Darwinism, it devolves to create asphalt, and that's the so-called tar paradox. But, you know, I'm surprised after three years of people focusing on this problem. And remember, you, your chances of solving a problem dr drop to zero if you don't work on the problem, right? <laughs> but one of the problems is, if say you made RNA, how would you preserve it? Because RNA is well known for forming asphalt. Well, you know, Elisa Biondi, who's here in the room someplace, will, has come up with a solution to that problem. It may not be the solution, but it's no longer a paradox. Or how do you make, you know, activated nucleoside phosphates Everybody is still back in the orgle problem, right, where they are going and making uh, methyl imidazolides as their activation. Well, it turns out that magnesium borophosphate minerals make diphosphates of nucleosides. And speaking of orgle, there are these problems which we call orgle hard. There's a paradox, right? If the Leslie Orgle tries something and it failed, it can't be done. But, you know, Hyojun Kim is in the room now showing that orgle sold you could make cytidine out of cytosine in ribosome. You can, as long as you do something that Ram Krishnamurthy told you about 20 years ago. And so you can go back through these paradoxes and you say, well, what's remaining now? Now, in the RNA world, first, it's quite clear. There's some things. Chirality is a big problem for us. We don't know, and maybe Mueller will tell me why, what RNA can do after you make it. There's a big problem there. But Keep in mind that if you focus on what you like to work on, you're not necessarily going to solve a problem that is actually critical to solving the big problem, something that the community would recognize. And so, not to contradict Carl too strongly, but one of the problems with alternative models, like metabolism first, is that the way those models are formulated, are, their questions are asked in a non-actionable way, and that meaning that there's no way you can go in and actually do something. So that's the second thing. First, make your research focus on a problem that if you solve it, you actually solve part of the bigger problem, and many people don't do that. And the second, if you're going to ask a question, make it philosophically constructed so that there's actually an answer that might actually be something other than the number 42. So now I'm prepared to die. Thank you. <laughs> We're, we're going to take one last question. I actually just have a like, request. So I'm a professor of physics at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. And um, we have astronomers who do dark matter. We have someone who is studying squid and vision. And they always fight about hiring. And these guys want astro. These guys want uh, soft matter. So I said, oh, but like, there's this astrobiology field. And then everybody was so negative. So, what I want you to send me some email, how I can pitch this to a faculty meeting so that in a physics department we can hire uh, an astrobiologist. I see a lot of value, but they don't see it. Right. I'll give you my email. Oh, 
Yeah, yeah. If you okay. say, say your name one more time. So we I, I have a super big comment. Please do the same also in regards to University of Texas at Arlington. We have oh, the we same will. problem. Right. Thank you. All right. Very good. Let's thank our panel one more time and thank you for coming.